Today, we're going to talk about uh, creating forms to allow us to get data from the browser to the server so that the server can do its thing and <coughs> customize, create a custom page for us. Uh, we talked about client server, um, client the web server interaction last time. And we have something like this where with server-side scripting, the client, which is typically someone want running a web browser, is connected to the internet, to a web server, and the web server doesn't have completed web pages ready out there because these are dynamic pages which means that these pages change based on certain conditions take for example a Google search you go to the same page regardless of what you search for and yet the output that you get looks very different why is that well one of the reasons is because there is form data, like what are you searching for? And if you're searching for HTML, for example, the web server will take that, look up in Google's database pages that have HTML or the pages about HTML, retrieve those pages, format it, and create custom for your request an HTML page, which contains HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. However, remember that we're not starting out with completed HTML page. We're starting out with these scripts, which could be in ASP.NET, or it could be in Python, or PHP, or any number of other languages. Think of these as being recipes, instructions on how to make a web page. All right? And it takes the form data that gets sent as part of the request, uses that and interacts with the database typically to create a page custom for you. And we can think of tons of examples of this. Um, any sort of search works like this. Um, if you bring up a product on eBay, you go and you pull up a particular product. That product, based on what you've typed in, is pulled up from the database and the details of the product, including the current price are shown. You log in the Canvas. We both log in the Canvas. We both go to the same page. And our pages look similar, but they're different. Why are they different? Well, because they're customized for us, each of us. Mine is customized for me. So I put in my, in a form, I put in my user ID and password. When you log on, you put in your user ID and password. That gets sent to the web server as part of the request. It looks up in the database to see, first of all, to make sure that we're a valid uh, user of the system. And if it is, it pulls up our information, like what class classes we're taking and what our role is in those classes. So it creates a page custom for me, and it creates one custom for you every time you log on. Well, as we said last time, we're not covering server-side scripting in this class, but we are covering the creation of a form, because that is HTML. Forms are entered in HTML. So what we're going to look at is how you create the mechanism in HTML, how do you create the forms that takes and sends information from the browser to the server to be processed. Now in order for us to do that, we're going to have to borrow someone's server-side script. For the assignment, for example, uh, I provided a server-side script for you. In this example, we're going to borrow the Google search engine, all right? And it's okay. They allow us to do it. It's not like this is like doing something that's violating security or anything. 
We're going to look at, if we do a Google search for something, and I'll show you what I did in a minute here, but to start out, if I do a search for HTML, all right, I'm going to show you two things. Actually, I lied. I'm going to show you this now. Here's two things that are relevant. If I do a Google search, notice the page that I get sent to. HTTPS, <laughs> www.google.com slash search question mark. Yes, the screen's not on. You cannot see that. <coughs> so let's try this again. I go to Google and I type in HTML. <coughs> Here's the page that I go to. I copy that and I pasted that in the notepad. First of all, the page that I go to starts off slash slash www.google.com slash search question mark. All right. Everything before the question mark is um, the page that is actually doing the search. So the name of the page that's doing the search is www.google.com slash search. Now notice it doesn't matter what I search for. I can do a search for something else. Do a search for CSS, three. And the first part of the URL is identical. www.google.com slash search. So that is actually the page that does the search. www.google.com slash search. That's the address of the page that does the search. Now, if you notice, after the question mark is what is called the query string. And that allows all sorts of other information to be passed from the client to the server. Now, I'm going to look at one particular piece of information over here. Q equals. And if you notice, and if you look close, in the first one, Q equals HTML. And the second one, Q equals CSS. So this part of the URL, this part of the query string on the URL, contains the term that is being searched for. So I don't have to use Google to do a Google search. I could type in... I could type in search question mark Q equals JavaScript. And there's a Google search for JavaScript. All right. Now, it would be a hassle to do that, right? Because you'd have to remember all the codes, and you have to remember it's Q equals, and type it in. So it give you a nice form to be able to do that. But what this is doing is this is calling a server-side script called search, and it is passing a variable called Q, which is the thing that I'm searching for. So if I can recreate that in an HTML page, I can write my own page to do a Google search. And that's exactly what we're going to do. All right, I'm going to create a page to do uh, a Google search um, by sending a request to www.google.com search and passing the thing that I want to um, 
search for on the query string. And I'm going to call it Q, because that's what Google's expecting. If I put something else in here, it doesn't know what to make of it. All right? But if I put Q equals, doesn't matter what I put after it, It does the search for me. All right, so let's go and let's create our web page. All right, I'm just going to create some basic stuff here the tags that are used on every page. Now, if you're doing a project yourself, you or someone on your team is going to be writing the client and the server. You're going to be writing the form and the server-side script that, that does the search. But in this class, we only talk about HTML, so we don't talk about server-side script, so we have to use someone else's. So it'd either be you, in which case you'd know the name of the script because you made the script, and you'd know what you need to call it on the query string because you made the query string, or someone on your team did, so you'd be able to get that information. All right, here's the basic shell of our web page that we've been doing since day one, more or less. All right, I'm going to start by putting a form tag on the page. All right. You can think of a form tag as being like an envelope that we're putting everything that we send to the server inside the form tag. In this particular case, with the Google search, all we're putting in is one value, the thing that we're searching for. But we actually could put a bunch of things in there. For example, if this were a page that registered someone for a site, we might put in a name, first name, last name, city, state, zip, all the separate fields. So we might stuff in that envelope five or six different things. All right? They would all be between the start and end form tag. Now, form tag has two attributes. A method and an action. For now, we're going to use a method of get. And I'm not going to really talk about the other method right this minute. But method of get, what that will do is that will send the data on the query string. This is especially useful for debugging because we actually see what, what we're sending to the server. The other thing that we send to the server, or, or the, other, the other attribute on this, relates to where we're sending it on the server, and that is the action. And the action equals the URL of where we're sending it. Now, if you remember from our search before, we're sending it to, to HTTP slash slash www.google.com slash search. So it's everything before the question mark on the query string. Everything but the question mark on the URL, rather. So those are the two attributes of the form. You have to have this for the form to work. The method describes how we're sending it. The action describes where we're sending it to. So this is the name of the server-side script that's going to be processing the data. Then we have our end tag. All right. So far, so good. 
first tag we're going to look at that belongs to a form is an input tag. And there's a couple variations of the input tag. One of them is for a text box. So if I say input type equals text, that allows me, I didn't want to close that, I wanted a quote here. That allows me to have a text box. What is a text box? It's a box that allows me to put in a single line of text. So that's sufficient for a search. In other words, if I look at Google's form, this is a text box. It's a place to put a single line of text. Now, there are some other attributes that I can put in. For now, I'm only going to put one of them in. Keep in mind that we're going to build to sort of the, the complete solution. All right? So I'm going to omit some things at first to make it simple. But the one thing that you definitely need is you definitely need the name of the field. And what is the name of the field? The name of the field is what it's going to be called on the query string. Now, when we did a search, we saw what it was called on the query string was Q. All right? So, Q name equals Q. How did I get that again? I did a Google search. And I looked at the URL. And before the question mark, that's going to be the action. That's the name of the server-side script that does the processing. I also looked closely at the query string and saw that the field that we're searching for is named Q. The little ampersand is what separates things on the query string. Fields on the query string come in pairs. There's a name, an equal sign, and the value. And then a semicolon, and then the next thing. So, Q equals HTML. So the name of the field that, of the thing that I'm searching for is Q. So therefore, I got to call it Q in my form. All right. I need one more thing to make this work. I need a button that says, "Okay, take everything that you've entered in and send it to the server," and that is a submit button. That's also with an input tag, but the type equals submit. I'm going to also give it a, uh, a name. This one, it really doesn't matter what I call it. The important one is Q. So I'm just going to call it button submit. And I'm going to give it a value. And the value is going to be the text that's going to be on the button. So I'm going to say search. And that's it. That's enough to write a simple search for Google. All right. Let me review what I have. I have three new tags here, or actually two new tags. Uh, one tag that has a couple of uh, variations in it. I have the form tag. The form tag goes around everything that's being sent to the server. The form tag has two attributes. A method, which for now we're always going to make it get. And then finally we have an action, which is the name of the script that we're going to send our data to. 
So the name of the script that we're sending our data to is http colon slash slash www.google.com slash search. Everything before the question mark. What are we sending it to it? Well, we're going to have a text box where we can enter in the thing that we're searching for. And we know based on our examination of the URL that that field needs to be Q. It has to have a name of Q. The other thing we need is we need a submit button to sort of tell it to go ahead and actually do the search. And that's what it does. And so it's, the type is not text because it's not a text box. It's a submit button. The name is button submit. That really doesn't matter in this case, but we'll give it that name. And then finally, the value is search. That's going to be the text on it. So let's go and save this. There's a text box, and I can type in what I am interested in, HTML, click the button, and there's my search for HTML. Let's look at the URL. There's a page it called, google.com, search. There's my Q equals HTML. There's my submit button, btn submit equals search. And there's some stuff that um, it inserted on its own, that gws underscore rd equals SSL. That was added by it. But notice how each of these fields on the query string are submitted by an ampersand. So that server-side script has the ability to take what we've entered in and do a search on it. It interacts with the databases or whatever else Google uses to whatever their magic recipe is to come up with the best search possible and um, it comes up with that. All right, pretty nifty. Huh? Okay. Um, that's the basics of, of forms. Now, we get a lot more involved than this. First of all, formatting forms. All right. Typically what you do well, I'm going to save that because we only have one field. It doesn't really make sense to format it. Uh, I am going to add a label tag here, right? Because if someone came to this page, they might not be able to see exactly what the purpose of this page is. So I'm going to put a text that says search on here. search for. So, there it says search for. 
here's the interesting thing, all right? I know that that is what I'm searching for because I can see it. And imagine if there were a bunch of fields on this page, not just one text box, but a bunch of text boxes. One for name, one for address, one for city, state, and zip. I would know what the label, but what label belonged to what text box based on where it was physically located. In other words, the labels that were right next to the text boxes were the label for that text box. People that are blind to access this with a screen reader, though, can't rely on being able to tell the position. They need another way of associating a label with a text box. All right? So there's a label tag for that. And it's actually pretty straightforward, although some students get a little confused about it. All right? Let me try to show you um, how this works. First thing we do is we put a label tag around the little text message. I'm going to put some space there because we're going to add some stuff there. Alright. So, I have a label tag around it. That still doesn't help someone that can't see it though. Because it'll show up in a label tag, but we have to have some way of saying what this label tag belongs to. We can't say, well, you know that thing that's right to the right of this? Yeah, that's the text box that it belongs to, because people can't see that. So we have to use an ID to point to the text box that this belongs to. So we say for equals ID name. What is that saying? It's saying this is the label for the thing that has an ID of ID name. And what we have to do then is we have to put an ID on the text box of ID name. So that's what, for a screen reader, connects this label with this text box. For equals, and then you put the ID of the text box in. Now I just put ID name. You don't have to start off with ID. In fact, I could just call this name. Or actually I could call this Q. That's what I wanted to say. You'll see this a lot, that a text box will have both a name and an ID, and they'll be the same thing. I know that's a little confusing, all right? But certain things in HTML and server-side scripting use the name. Certain things use the ID. So one way to keep it straight is just give it the same name and ID. Remember, with an ID, you can't have two things on the page with the same ID. So I can't have something else on the page with the ID of Q. All right? So in this case, the name is what it gets called on the server side. So the server side is expecting a Q. The ID is what is used to match the label up with this text box. So I give it a ID of Q also, but I say for equals Q um, on, the, um, on the text box. Questions about this? All right. Now the next few examples that we give, 
we're going to stop doing Google searches. I'm just going to make up a dummy name. All right. Now, for your homework, I give you the name of the file. I give you the URL of the file that you want to use. All right. But in this case, I'm just going to make up a name. And uh, it's not going to work because that script doesn't exist. But I'll make up a, a, a dummy name. All right. Now, text boxes are one of the fields that you can have on the form. So far, we've studied two kinds of things that you can have on the form. You can have a text box, and you can have a button. What are some other things that are on a form besides text boxes and buttons? Yes? Checkboxes. Checkboxes. What is a checkbox? A box you can check. All right. If you have more than one checkbox, can you check both of them? Yes. Yes. All right. That was what I was getting at. A checkbox is a series of, is one or more boxes that you can check that work independently. Those are usually uh, uh, done, uh, those are usually shown as being square boxes that you can fill in with an X. All right. So, you would use that when you have a list of selections that are not mutually exclusive. So let's talk about a form that we could use to enter student information for students that are interested in Lorraine Community College. <coughs> we might have a name, which would be a text box, an email address, which is a text box. Um, Previous education. And we can have in here, let's say, the choices are attending high school, high school grad, Um, attended some college, high school grad GED, attending high school, high school grad GED, attended some college. Let's say those are the three choices that we want to have. Then I'm going to have a list of fields that I'm interested in. All right? that the student is interested in. And maybe it would be software development, web development, networking, and mobile development. What state do you live in? And that would be Alabama. Alabama's the first state, right? Alphabetically, I think. Through Wyoming. So it'd be, you know, a bunch of them. And finally, I have comments. All right. Shouldn't put, I shouldn't have put any of these in. Alright. And finally we have a submit button. Okay, that's easy. That's a submit button. These two are easy. These are going to be text boxes. Interested in would be example of a checkbox. Right? Because if we look at the checkbox, you could be interested in all of them or one of them, or none of them, I guess, right? So these will be done via a checkbox. All 
all right or we can have networking web mobile and software previous education those are mutually exclusive right in other words one of those statements is true all right you're either attending high school, you're a high school grad, GED, or that you've attended some college. All right? What would we use for this? Would we use a text box for this? No. All right? Why would we not use a text box for this? Yes? Exactly. Um, the server is expecting the data to come over in a certain format, to look a certain way. All right? And therefore, if I use a text box for this, um, the user would have to type in exactly the way that the server was expecting it. And if they didn't, there could be problems. And it would be essentially useless. So. One student might type in attending high school. One student might say attending HS. Uh, another student might type in attending Lorraine High School. It could put all kinds of different possibilities in there. So where we, when you want to limit the user to only having certain numbers of options, there's a couple things that you can do, but you're not going to use a text box. What is one way that we could solve this? What is one thing we could have? Radio buttons. Radio buttons are similar to check boxes, except usually they're represented as circles. And the difference is, is that they're mutually exclusive. Which means that if they're set up correctly, you can't pick two of these. You can only pick one. And it's just like the radio button in your car. If you're listening to one station and you click another button, the old station goes off and the new station comes on. It's not going to play both of them at the same time. All right? So as you click these, the other ones go off. And they're mutually exclusive. All right? That's different than the checkboxes, where the checkboxes are not mutually exclusive. So you could pick more than one. Which one do you use? Well, it depends on the situation. It depends on the kind of data that you have and whether it's mutually exclusive or not. All right? In this case, well, it makes sense that someone is going to be one of these things, but they're not going to be two or three of them. So you would give them a radio button. Whereas the things that you're interested in, it makes sense that someone could be interested in more than one of those items. You could be interested in software and web development, or mobile and networking, or whatever. So you want the ability to pick more than one. What's a different way that we could do this besides a radio button? Because there's another thing we could do too. There's another way we can do it. And I don't know if people are shy or maybe they're just, uh, maybe it's not obvious what the other way is, but we'll come to it. What about state? The state that you live in. Is that something that's mutually exclusive or is it something that you can live in more than one state at a time? It's mutually, it's mutually exclusive. So we could use radio buttons for that, right? Drop down but list. a drop down would be better. So the drop down is what I was getting at for the educational status as well. You could use a drop down for that and have three options for it. It's possible to configure a drop down not to be mutually exclusive, but almost no one does. Uh, most people use a drop down uh, to give a list of mutually exclusive options. 
Why? Why use a drop down here and a radio button here? Because you could use radio buttons for this, or you could use a drop down for this. All right? Why would you choose to do one one way and one the other? It's just a matter of real estate. There's 50 states here, right? So if I had 50 radio buttons, that's going to take up a lot a lot on the screen. <coughs> All right? Whereas with this, this has the advantage that it shows you all three of your options without even clicking on them. All right? So you don't have to click them and then scroll through the options to see them. Now, you certainly could have used a drop down for this, and it would, would have been okay. I doubt you would ever use uh, radio buttons for the state, though, because that would simply take up too much space. Finally, comments is we don't want a single line text box for that because we would assume that maybe the student has a lot of comments. So we would use what's called a text area. And a text area is multiple lines that you can put in. <coughs> All right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to build this. Keep in mind that we're not going to have a server-side script to process this. So we're only going to build the form. All right? So we're not going to be able to test it by sending it to a script but we are going to build the form. So let's build the form for this. So let's start. I'm going to put in a dummy name here. Process PHP that doesn't exist. So we'll get an error when we click the submit button, but at least we can set up the form. I'm going to create the first couple of fields that are text boxes, name and email address. So here are my first two text boxes. All right. I have a label for the first one for name that points to this text box. Label for this one called email that points to this. And we're good to go. Let me save it and let's view this form. Now, generally speaking, you don't want the form, forms are generally speaking uh, arranged vertically. There are some forms that are horizontal, but if you can imagine, when we, the way I drew it on the board of having things arranged vertically is probably how we want to have it to, to, to look like. We're not going to extend things horizontally, in most cases. This gets to be a little confusing, but trust me, and it will work out okay. All right? Forms are really a list of items that you want to send to the server. If you think about it fundamentally, that's what a form is. So, 
we're going to put all our form elements in list item tags because it's an item on the list that we're sending to the server. This is going to help with the styling of the form. All right? So, maybe confusing at first, but I'm going to do that now. I'm going to go and I'm going to put a UL to say here is my unordered list. And each of these is going to be in a list item. Then I'm going to do some indenting to make it clear. So I'm going to indent that, indent that, actually indent that. And now we get this. So things are stacking up on top of each other. All right. Now, we might look at that and say, we don't like the way that it looks. We don't like the bullet points. They're too close together. Later on, we're going to have some other issues as well. All right. But these are all things that we can correct via CSS. All right. So remember that you put your HTML tags as they belong. These belong in a list of items. So we put them in a list of items. If we don't want them to look this way, whether we want them to be side by side, or whether we want them to be the, there to be more space between the two of them, or whether we want to get rid of the uh, bullet points, or whatever, we can control that with CSS. All right? So, what are we going to do next time? All right? I, we're, we're wrapping up today. We're going to style these a little better. We're going to implement the rest of the form tags that we have up on the board, and we're going to style, we're going to complete this form, and we're going to style it so it looks the way that we want it to. All right? We're going to add some other features to this. Um, the ability to group a form, a break a form down into sections, for example. Those are called field sets. Those sometimes help with accessibility. All right. We are then going to look at some HTML5 form elements. Some recent addition to HTML5 that make our life a little bit easier. So we should be able to wrap up forms or mostly wrap up forms on Monday. All right. Uh, and then we'll get into tables and then we'll get into, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm wishful thinking. I'm thinking it's Thursday already. All right. It's only Tuesday. Should be able to wrap up forms on Thursday of this week. And then next Tuesday we will start on tables. All right. That's all I had. I will go unlock the lab, then I'll be back here to get my files and stuff, and then I will be back in, um, uh, in the lab.